And in the interest of time, we'll just keep moving on. So flip, um, there's a page showing the location of the proposed change. There's another map that looks almost the same, except that little rectangle is changed from red to gray in this image. And then there's a, a zoom in one that shows, that looks like this with a little dashed rectangle around the subject property. And then let's turn one more page to the, um, this aerial photo that Angie uh, had up a few minutes ago. Where we, I've overlaid the change that's proposed in the uh, boundary between Outer Highway Commercial and Core Commercial. Um, Angie made an interesting point, and I think this is illustrative. Um, one note is that, well, this boundary would align a little better with the one on the north side of the highway. Well, that's really only relevant when you're looking at that sort of big picture map. And you can sort of say, oh, well, yeah, that kind of aligns better. But when you get down close to the ground, there's no pedestrian crossing there. There's no street crossing there. You've got to go all the way back to Ivy for that. And, and the two sides of the highway, in my mind, are completely irrelevant uh, of where that falls uh, on the north and the south side of the highway because they're not interconnected. They, these are separate uh, sub-environments connected to where you really have your downtown core. So the next page is an image of the cover of a publication that ODOT and, we all know who ODOT is, right? And DLCD, the Department of Land Conservation and Development, they collaborated to take many years of work on transportation growth management projects all around the state and to compile that knowledge into a Main Street handbook. It's called Main Street When a Highway Runs Through It, a Handbook for Oregon Communities. And there, uh, the second page is the uh, uh, credits, acknowledgments of uh, who contributed to this. And it basically is a compendium of how to evaluate your downtown and then how to use building blocks and tools to design for a thriving downtown. So uh, if you'll turn your attention to the first uh, page of this chapter three, chapter three is the recipe for success from that book. And the first page discusses gateways. And uh, there's, a, there's an image of a two-story building, and uh, there's a vehicle in place here. They're in the process of installing a banner across the street. There's a caption, a banner is a common gateway element. A gateway, as your plan has noted, is a place where you want to grab people's attention and announce to them, you've arrived somewhere, look around, take interest in, in what's around you. And there are a variety of ways to do that. Uh, banner is one. You can add to that with uh, architecture, landscaping, fountains, and other special features. But the bottom line is, you have arrived and we welcome you. So that's one key concept that is reflected in your plan. Um, the second concept is street zones. And street zones are important because you can't just wish a pedestrian environment into life anywhere. You need to achieve a level of concentration. Main streets are about a quarter mile long, typically, because that's a five minute walk, and it's the area that people are comfortable circulating in. Um, and you get much outside of that, and it, it, it tends not to work very well. Well, as it happens, the distance, and this slide is right on point, thankfully, um, this is a, a Google Earth image that I uh, grabbed. And let me get up and point something out. This box is a measurement showing 1,512 feet and change. And it's from this point at the, um, uh, I think this is Ivy Street. This is Grant. And it's measuring down here to Elm. Now remember, in your downtown Canby overlay diagram, this is the big primary gateway location at Grant. And then there's a secondary gateway down here at Elm and a secondary gateway at Ivy. And that distance between the two is 1,500 feet. And most of your downtown is not here. Most of your downtown is over on the north side of the highway across the railroad tracks. So the game is a little different in Canby. What you're trying to do for people going by on the, on the highway is at these gateway locations, pique their interest and engage them in a way that makes them want to turn and come into the north side of downtown. That's the winning game here in Canby. Well, this site is 900 feet away from this roughly quarter mile downtown core opportunity that you have along the highway. It's, it's almost another quarter mile away. 
and uh, we'll talk about why that's important in a second. The key here, though, is that be, uh, being focused and compact adds to that sense of vitality, and that uh, contributes to reaching a critical mass that makes your downtown work. <clears throat> so the next page is a, a section diagram showing a typical street and the ratio of the width of the street to the height of the buildings. And they're talking about a 1 to 2 ratio or a 1 to 3 ratio. So this, this would correspond, in fact, uh, before our meeting, I just had dinner at the Canby Pub and Grill. Two-story building, street beside it, parking on the sides, two lanes, and uh, I don't remember now if it's a one- or a two-story building across the street, but this is the kind of environment that you see in, in this downtown core area of Canby where you really feel like the streetscape is, is creating a place. You feel enclosed, the buildings are defining that space because you've got this ratio of one to two or one to three of um, width to height. But when you get out to the highway areas, and this bottom di diagram is showing this contrast, out on the highway areas where you only have low uh, buildings and they're set back from the roadway and your ratio is dropping to something more like 1 to 5 or 1 to 7, you never reach that sense of enclosure and being in a, a, a safe place. And it's hard to achieve a pedestrian-oriented environment when the scale of the place isn't enclosing you and sort of giving you a hug, as it were. And it really is meaningful on people's behavior and how they respond to their environment. So that, uh, and that goes to the question of how strong is the, the likelihood, if you will, to really create a pedestrian environment at that particular location. We'll talk about that in a minute. So this next diagram is not specifically of Canby, but conceptually, I think you'll recognize it. The red segment up here is a segment of highway called the rural segment, where typical speed limit is 55 miles an hour. And then there's a different blue speed zone. They call it the suburban segment, typically about 40 miles an hour. And you, as you go through that, in the, uh, approaching the, the core of your downtown, over on the right, you'll see the label transition area. And that transition brings you to a gateway. And the gateway is where the color changes from blue to green. And here, we're in the Main Street District downtown, and the speed limit drops to 25 miles per hour. So this is describing a transition uh, in where, for safety reasons and for attention reasons, you're letting drivers know with a variety of signage and scale, remember the size of the buildings and how close they are to the street and so forth, that they're coming to a very different place from being out on the highway, and we want their behavior to slow down, look around, take interest in their environment, and ideally stop and shop and participate in your community. Well, this is important in this instance because on the next page I've got a slide or uh, a photo of um, the sign coming into Canby which is very attractive. This is just north of the Hulbert's Flowers store. You can kind of make out its driveway in the background. And right there is the 35 mile per hour speed limit sign. So we're, it's important to note because this is right across the street from Locust Street and adjacent to the subject property which you can barely see just off the left edge of the, prop, of the photo here. But this is not, uh, from the standpoint of looking back, at this transition, I would uh, suggest to you that we're really not at this point yet where we're in the downtown core, we're bringing the speed down to 25 miles per hour and so forth. We're really back here fairly early in the transition area where the drivers are being notified it's not 45 anymore, it's time to back off down to 35. And when you get to Ivy, that's when you're going to have a, a traffic signal, you're going to be going 25, and so forth. So the location becomes really important from the standpoint of this transition because we're, the, the speed along the highway is really not saying you're in the core yet. We're still pretty far outside of it. And as we noted up here, about 900 feet yet to go before you get to that core area. So this next diagram is uh, essentially the same photo on which I have taken the same concept. You see these asterisks that are um, on your downtown Canby overlay plan. There's a big one over the Grant intersection, and there are two smaller ones over Ivy and Elm. 
in this conceptual drawing. And I borrowed that concept and I've just, you know, used a Windows object to drop on there. And I've stretched them north-south in the same way that they did on this diagram. They're not round, they're, they're stretched out north-south because, again, the game is getting people's attention and intriguing them to cross the railroad tracks and come into the north side of town where your, your real uh, downtown core is. And so that's where the action is, is between these two <coughs> secondary gateways with uh, uh, Grant being right at the core, and then we're way over here on the outskirts, uh, fairly far to the, to the east. <coughs> and so uh, as we, as our team looked at it with your staff, it seemed to become clear that maybe this environment, when you look at it close up, is better served being in the Outer Highway Commercial District. So the next page is a photograph that, uh, it's, a, it's a photo montage. I stood out there and I took a series of pictures, you know, pivoting in place, and then I recomposed them to be able to uh, make it look as if you are uh, on the left side looking northeast. This is shot from the north side of the highway. Over on the far right side, there's our Canby sign and the 35 mile per hour sign. And as you pan to the left, right under where it says south, that's the subject property is that vacant site there. And a little more to the left where it says southeast, that's a truck staged in the existing gas station, which is on the east side of Locust. And then as you proceed to the east, there's our highway-oriented uses over there, and then northeast is the direction of the highway. So this goes to that question of what's the scale here? <coughs> Do we have that kind of one to three or one to two ratio? No, we really don't. This is a very wide highway corridor with no <coughs> buildings on, in fact, one side at this location. There are no buildings on the north side. In the next frame, this frame is shot specifically aligned on the north side of the highway looking straight down Locust Street. So you can see precisely where Locust aligns. So the subject property is just to the right of Locust Street, the vacant site there. And immediately to our right is the driveway for Hulbert's Flowers. And then finally, this is on the, uh, a little bit behind the corner at the edge of the subject property on Locust. So if you, um, and so you're looking across, you can see the, uh, the city of Canby sign is right there. The speed limit sign is across from us. The, uh, on the right is the fuel station that exists on the east side of Locust. And then immediately to the left, this grassy field is actually the subject property. So it gives you an I image of what, what is around this intersection. And the core concept is to create something that says to pedestrians, this is a place to be. But it's not, you know, I don't know if you saw the movie Blazing Saddles where the, the guys are riding their horses out in the desert and suddenly they come upon a toll gate and they have to go back and get a, a hat load of, of dimes so that they can go through this toll booth in the middle of the desert. And it's comedy, but it doesn't work like that. If you want to have a place where people are going to go and circulate and do business, there has to be other stuff there that creates more than just a, a, a building that happens to look like it belongs in, in Main Street. <clears throat> Let's see. Catch up with my notes. So the, to summarize, uh, it's a natural thing when a, a plan like this at the corridor level or the community level uh, moves forward. Sometimes communities will take the next step and do what's called the specific plan and they'll create a much smaller project area than you have for this whole corridor along 99 for literally the entire community. You might take a much smaller piece and take several months with a consultant uh, or a team and a, a, a group of citizens from the community and really focus on that area and fly spec more of those details. Where exactly should everything be? But it's literally not possible to do that at the scale that the downtown can be overlay plan uh, is prepared at. That's not its fault. Uh, you know, we're not saying it's wrong. 
we're saying that it, it is fundamentally right, but it needs fine tuning when it comes to the implementation. And the key thing about that Main Street concentration concept at that quarter mile is, if you don't focus the activity there for those pedestrian oriented, -oriented businesses, and you open up more areas to it, then people, you know, when somebody's making a location decision with a business, well, it costs more to locate here right in Main Street, and it costs a little bit less, I think I'll try over there and save some money. Well, that does two things. It doesn't put them where they need to be to be successful, and it tends to dilute the concentration of the community's downtown core. And I've worked on many of these TGM projects where the recommendation ultimately was, you've got too much commercial land and you need to ratchet it down and tighten it up and focus it to really create a place and then think about what wraps around that. It's some other combination of maybe office oriented uses or, or housing or whatever and it's very very tailored to the local community. In this instance you have a highway corridor and it's very very suitable uh, for uses that, uh, that are uh, accommodating to people who need their cars for their transportation. And it's, uh, frankly, I don't think it will be helpful to try to extend your downtown core concept farther than it naturally wants to be able to go. And focusing more tightly on that, um, that quarter mile uh, ultimately I think will serve you in the end. So with that in mind, I think I'll rest unless you have any specific questions. So um, my name again is Steve Abel. I'm a lawyer and I've done this for some years and um, I want to thank Lee for that presentation because your comprehensive plan in essence tells us that the process that you're in today is the right process and one of the I think I, when I look at the what the Planning Commission did that kind of centered on four problems if you will was reasons for the application to be recommended for denial and I want to speak to those for a moment but one of those is some notion that the process that created that overlay created some kind of precedent that was locked in concrete at the time and there was much conversation in fact if you look at the transcript from the Planning Commission hearing you'll find that really dominates that conversation and one of the things that didn't happen in that process was um, someone pointing out what the comprehensive plan itself says about the process and about what the city does when it gets more specific information like the information that that Lee has given you and let me just read you part of your comprehensive plan because I think it goes right to this issue of the very process that you're in so beginning in the mid sentence this is the comprehensive plan of the city of Canby it represents a major step in a planning process, process which began in 1973. It is not a final step by any means, but a major step in, this, in, this, in, in that this document will be the guiding force of city planning for the foreseeable future. It has been amended since it, its initial adoption in 1981, and it will continue to be amended from time to time as new information becomes available. That is a natural evolutionary process as city planning cannot remain static any more than the city itself can. It goes on to say, the city's recognition of the fact that the plan will not remain static is demonstrated by its intention to improve upon this plan as more and better data becomes available. The very data I think that Lee's talking about. Amendment procedures and an established process for periodic review and updating are included within the text. And that's what we're asking for is an amendment to the plan, the zone text, the zone map in order to meet the needs of the city and its citizens through this uh, new information. And I think that's kind of the missing key that the Planning Commission didn't focus upon is that the plan is that your comprehensive plan itself points you in the direction of having a vibrant uh, comprehensive plan, in fact a living document that allows you to be nimble and to adapt to changing circumstances. A second issue that arose in, in the Planning Commission deliberation, and I, your staff has pointed this out on, the, on their memorandum to you, is the question of transportation. And I think staff did a good job of explaining to you that the traffic impacts at this level of the analysis for the question of whether this line should be moved on the map 
not for the design review, is, is a, at most a transportation study that you did receive and that your own consultant said was fine and adequate. Uh, in fact, the, the analysis is under, under statewide planning goal 12, is statewide planning goal 12 is the implementing document. It's in your criteria. The TPR, the transportation planning rule, is the rule that impl implements that. And the TPR only triggers in when there is going to be a significant effect on existing or planned transportation facility. Well, if the use is already allowed on this site, and we're only talking about design, there is no impact by the change that you're making here. The use is already allowed, and in fact, your comprehensive plan through the zoning C2 has already incorporated within its assumptions those trips. Those trips are already there. That's why the transportation study doesn't need to be anything complex. It only needs to say, is the use the same? The use is the same. Already allowed. It's only a question of what that design might look like. The third item that came up was a reference to the Gateway Corridor Plan. And again, your staff did a good job. And I should say, if you read the transcript, if you read the, the five pages, which are the deliberation, those two first components, the precedent issue and the traffic issue, uh, were the predominant issue. Uh, the Gateway Corridor Plan came up, not by name, uh, but I went back and looked at the Gateway Corridor Plan. And in fact, um, as, as staff says, it's not adopted, but, but I did. I did notice within the Gateway Corridor Plan that, that as I read it, I concluded that it's not the, not the tail that wags the dog. The dog is the, your comprehensive plan that says what the uses can be, and the, the Gateway Plan is just about how that highway is going to interact. It's not how the highway demands what the uses are going to be on the properties that are located adjacent to the highway. And in fact, there are statements within the Gateway Plan that are very clear. It says, minimize private property impacts. Ensure that o Oregon 99E supports existing and planned land uses throughout the city consistent with the city's comprehensive plan. So it is, it is not the, it's not the dog, and it's not the tail that wags the dog. It's responsive to your city's comprehensive plan. And while it's not uh, a binding document in this process, it, if you read it, uh, provides the guidance you need that's necessary in order to to draw the conclusion that this is an appropriate request. And then finally, the last issue that's mentioned by your staff is the question of the need for the change. And, and you know, the, the criteria is on the board a public need for the change. And you can find public need in lots of ways. Um, I thought about this a little bit and, and thought that one of the, after hearing Lee, I, I think the, the major public need is to get the plan right so that it actually allows the property to develop uh, in that location. That property's been vacant for a long time and hasn't developed. And if there's an opportunity to create economic vitality on that site through getting the overlay right, uh, that is paramount public need. And that doesn't, we don't reach the question of public need in any other way. We don't need to talk about what the ultimate use might be. We talk about what the correct planning might be, and the correct planning would be the public need itself. So those are the four reasons that the Planning Commission seemed to have gone off incorrectly on that I just wanted to describe. And I, and I, I want to just focus back to, to Lee's presentation. And, and I'm, I, I was on the, the Portland City Council for some time, or, or Planning Commission for about eight years, I guess. And we always mapped as probably your planning commission did and you as a city council do in pretty gross ways. We, we map with a color and we draw lines, but we don't do an analysis site by site on what that property should have and what it shouldn't have and make determinations that are that specific. And in fact, now with the information that Lee's been able to come up with about that site and how it interrelates and how you urban plan that site, we now have that specificity that's necessary in order to make the site actually work. So I think it's, I think it is a very appropriate request that Fred Meyer has made uh, to um, allow for this property to be amended, the overlay to be amended. We believe it meets the criteria. And with that, Lee and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And we'll just reserve, if there are no questions, we'll just reserve the remainder of our time for rebuttal. Thank you for your time.
Okay, we now have uh, proponents. Oh, <coughs> opponents. <coughs> opponents. 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 Uh, opponents, excuse me. Opponents. And we got uh, proponents first here. There, there could be proponents other than the applicant. Right. So Sorry. Pro proponents up, down. Oh, okay. Proponent. Okay. Yes. Do I get a <laughs> 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 Just want to make clear here. Oh, let's change that. Um, good evening. Once again, my name is Beth Doolittle, and I'm um, the director of the Canby Chamber of Commerce. And um, I'm hoping that I could clarify a few things. The chamber worked with the city on the committee that put the new design standards together. Um, this committee, our directive, was more to focus on um, what the sites look like, what the um, building design was, and those related requirements. So that's what we, as a committee, worked on and the parking, the landscape, rather <coughs> on the types of businesses that could be there. Um, I could answer the question for you as to why that um, line was drawn right there. It's a very simple answer. Because Oliver Lang was building a building. That's, that's why it was put there. Their building was being constructed or designed and it was going to be the first building that met the new design standards. And so the line was drawn there. End of story. That's why it was there. Has nothing else to do with anything else other than this building was um, there, was going to be the first one there, and everybody was excited about that. Nobody could foresee the, what the economic downturn was and that that building wasn't going to happen and um, how it would relate then to how building, how it would um, alter, you know, the other businesses, the businesses that could go in there. So that never came into um, play at all if this building, because this building was going to be built there. And so that it met the um, criteria of what the property use was. So that's, that's, that's it. That's, there was nothing else that went into consideration there. So um, with that, um, I think that's the design, design standards were done. Um, the, oh, once the, the design standards were done, then the, um, ch the, ch the <coughs> chamber um, worked with the planning um, commission and we went and redid the sign codes so that both of these two um, committees worked together and that the standards then that was put together out of the design standards that the code standards <coughs> then complemented and worked within them. So we worked real hard for several years to make sure that those two um, components of the city's standards then were redone. So does that help answer that question for you guys as to why this was done? Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Any other proponents? <laughs> Brian Oliver, 1590 North Ponderosa, Canby. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, just a few things here that I want to bring up. <clears throat> uh, Bev kind of stole my thunder on, on the line there. It was, I brought my, uh, you may see me on hoarders, but this is my 2007 downtown 99E workbook from this project that went down. So um, I could be a paid historian if the city's got any extra fundage for that. Um, but anyway, our building here in this lower picture was um, in design, and so that's why that line was bumped out there, because um, it was the first one that was going to meet these uh, these design standards and be able to go and, and not have to go through the whole uh, planning commission model and all that good stuff. Um, obviously, the economy has changed that, and uh, the land is still vacant. Um, with that being said, um, as I spoke in the uh, July Planning Commission meeting, what I'm passing around here are uh, members that were also on this Design Standards Committee, um, uh, Mr. Tom Scott, Roger Reif, Catherine Davis, Casey Rapp, and then the consultant that led this group, Matt Hasty, with Kogan Owen Kogan, I believe, uh, who, who was our leader in this. Uh, basically what it says is, what we thought we were doing, and again, I apologize because when we put this together five years ago, our intent was not to put a 12-layer cake 
in front of you guys. So if anybody wanted to change it, uh, we're going to be in the council. We're just going to take five months in planning and, and city. That was not our intent. What we thought we were doing from Joe Citizen perspective was making buildings nice in this area. That was our intent. And I, I said that in J July, and apparently the Planning Commission really didn't buy what I was selling. And I'll say it again and again, and I have hopefully uh, with these letters and notes from other uh, committee members, uh, that's what our intent was, is to make things look pretty inside different zones. Um, and lo and behold, apparently we have done a whole lot more <laughs> than we ever bargained for. Um, so that is um, basically the, the gist of what those notes are in, in front of you, because I know that 280 pages just wasn't enough. So I wanted to add a little bit more to your workload. Um, and, and finally, uh, kind of on a citizen's uh, input here, um, I, I like to think of myself as somewhat involved in our community and, and volunteer. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out, you know, the, I think the reason we're here is a, a, the group, the Save Downtown Canby group. Um, and I'm trying to figure out who this group is. Um, they, they came, or a representative came to our chamber meeting back in the summer. Um, and what he had told us is there was three or four members at the time, and they were all gas stations. So, you know, from my putting in two two together, uh, I'm not an economist here, but I, I'm guessing it's not because they're they're intended that they don't want to see our city develop. I'm thinking that it's got something else to do, and I'll let you guys do the math on that. That um, if it's gas station oriented, that's it's not a, not for this project. Then maybe there's something else to it. Um, and, and I'll leave it at that. And if I could just, um, one other thing, finally, um, reading through your, uh, your packets online, um, did I see that the city staff did approve this back in July? Is that correct? Did I see, read that, that city staff approved this? Is that right? Is that correct? Recommended. recommended it? Okay. I just wanted to make sure that somebody had said that it was recommended because I, I think they kind of briefed over it in the July meeting before uh, the hired guns took over, but I just wanted for my own two cents that, uh, that to know that the, the city staff had recommended it. Thank you. Any other proponents? I think that was all the hands we had. Okay, opponents. Anybody that would like to speak in opposition to this? Come forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, for the record, my name is Mike Connors uh, with the firm Hathaway Kovac Connors, uh, 520 South West EM Hill Street, Portland, Oregon, 97204. Uh, I represent Save Downtown Canby, which is a group of local business owners who are concerned about this proposal and who have testified and been involved in the planning commission process in opposition. I'm here to talk about our concerns and provide a little bit more, uh, shed a little bit more light on what happened uh, in front of the Planning Commission. Um, because the Planning Commission uh, went through two separate hearings on this, uh, had all the documents that you have now in your folder, but ha actually had time to digest uh, over the series of hearings and review this material and went through a very thoughtful <laughs> deliberation. And I encourage you to take a look at that transcript as you've been asked to do because there are members on the Planning Commission who were part of the effort that led to this downtown Canby overlay. I'm going to talk about that. And what you see is that they noted a series of problems and one of the big ones is the impact it's going to have on the plan. They identified a number of issues that they had that led to the recommendation for denial. And I, I'm not going to go through each one of these, but I do want to focus on two of them because I, I think I agree with Mr. Abel that the Planning Commission had two primary concerns, and those are our two primary concerns. After having reviewed all of this record material, they agreed with us. And those two are the following. First of all, we believe that this plan is inconsistent and will significantly undermine your downtown Canby overlay. And the second one is traffic impacts. This will have significant traffic impacts, and those impacts have not been assessed. Mitigation has not been proposed. And in fact, the TPR that you keep hearing about 
has never been provided as we believe it is required by state law and local law. The big one is the downtown Canby overlay. And so I want to talk just briefly about how that came about because I don't think you've heard enough about that uh, that will really put this in context for you. So back in 2007, the city council decided that it wanted to adopt a Canby downtown plan to revitalize the downtown area. That, that was one of the key economic growth uh, initiatives and goals for the city. And the downtown Canby overlay was the uh, ordinance that was adopted to implement that plan. It started out with a task force that was comprised of planners, professional planners, uh, local officials, city officials, state officials, stakeholders, property owners, and they went through a series of task force workshops, invited public, sought public input. Uh, then it went before the Planning Commission, who had multiple hearings, public hearings, took input from citizens, listened to the task force and the reasons for their plan, and then it went before the City Council, a two year process from 2007 through 2008 and if you look at the material that we provided you can see that there was an extensive amount of resource and thought put in to developing this plan. One thing that you've heard tonight which which we take strong issue with is this idea that the plan really isn't exact. It's arbitrary and you can't really tell where the lines are. Uh, that's absolutely not the case with this particular property. In fact, the reason that they need not only a zone change, but a text amendment is because your text in your land use regulation says the commercial core area goes from Elm Street to Locust. And you have a map that clearly designates where this boundary is. It was specifically chosen in this location. And you heard your own staff and the planning commission cited it as well in their deliberations, that there were specific reasons why that was the case. It's proximity to the downtown. It lined up exactly with ODOT's station area plan. The station area plan was ODOT's vision of a main street area, which is what this overlay is about, creating a main street area. It's proximity to the welcome sign to announce to people that you're now entering downtown Canby and the fact that it's a high pedestrian area. And in fact, you do have, not only in transportation system plan, but as part of the gateway plan, you have a pedestrian crossing that is being, that is identified in the TSP and is currently recommended in the gateway plan at this specific location. So there is a reason why it's here. And the reason that tonight you're hearing that you ought to think about second-guessing it is because Fred Meyer realizes they can't fit a service station in the commercial core overlay. Commercial core overlay is a pedestrian oriented zone. It was specifically adopted by the city to support pedestrian type uses. They want to convert it to an outer highway because that's an auto oriented zone. That's the only way that the service station can meet your regulations. <coughs> Now, I think what they're asking you to do, and which has my clients very concerned, is to take a two-year process that involved multiple parties, again, professionals, officials, property owners, stakeholders here in the city, and saying, you know what, forget about that, this plan's not really exact, it's somewhat arbitrary, we don't really know where the lines are. And so why don't you just go ahead and shift it? Well, it's our position, and I believe the Planning Commission agreed, that that's not what the record demonstrates. The reason that they're here, again, is because Fred Meyer wants to get their use approved. And you heard a lot of arguments as to why you should rethink this entire plan from Fred Meyer's consultant. And you've got to ask yourself, do you think that these consultants are here to give you the kind of opinion that the city heard in 2000 and 2008 for the consultants that they hired and told them this is what I think you ought to do. Uh, with all due respect, I think they're here because Fred Myers asked them to support their application. And so 
we think you've got to be really careful in taking a very deliberative, precise process and setting that aside in one night reviewing this entire record because Fred Meyer says, you know what, it's an arbitrary plan and we don't think that you ought to really give it much weight because that will establish precedent. The precedent it will establish is you will be adopting that rationale and guess what, anybody else that can't meet your plan is going to come in and say, this is not a precise plan, we don't even really know why it's adopted, um, just change it. And you know what, I have a use that can't comply, you change it for them, what about me? That is precedent. Now whether it's precedent that your comprehensive plan acknowledges, of course it acknowledges some changes, but if you truly felt that there was a problem with the plan you have today, wouldn't you want to do this through at least a process that's similar to the process that created it? If today you're being asked as part of a single application supporting a single use, reviewing this entire record in a single night to say, you know what, we're going to throw all that away and adopt a decision, wouldn't you want to do that through a more deliberative process where you can actually get input from your own consultants? You can hear more from the community. Nobody knows that the, that the plan is being questioned as maybe not as precise and that is much more fungible than I think and my clients believe that it was intended when it was adopted. So if you're going to make a change and you have questions about it, don't do it in this type of process. Do it in a legislative process. And we think if you were to do that, you would realize, see the record, that it isn't the way it's being characterized. And this particular boundary was precisely designated here. And it wasn't because Mr. Uh, Lang uh, or Mr. Oliver had a building there. There were multiple reasons. And so that is perhaps our biggest concern because if you adopt those policies tonight, you're opening the door for other people to come in and say, you've already made this policy determination and you've already allowed somebody else to change it. Guess what? We want the same treatment. And that will significantly undermine what we believe to be the whole purpose for adopting the plan. This is a long-term plan. Uh, unfortunately, it did happen in 2008. We had a we had a real estate recession. What the applicants have been saying is, well, this property hasn't developed. Well, not a lot has developed. And so, if you're going to take that tack, then what you're basically saying is a long-term plan doesn't work for anybody who hasn't developed in that time frame. And we think that it's a good plan. It's a well thought out plan, and you ought to stick by it. Don't undermine it or give up on it because a single user or service station wants to change it so they can accommodate their particular use. The second issue is traffic. There is a state law, and it's implemented as part of your code, called the Transportation Planning Room, TPR, which you've heard about it, that says anytime you amend your comprehensive plan or land use regulation, that includes a zoning, uh, zone change, you have to uh, provide a transportation planning rule analysis. And the difference between that and what you typically see with the development and what the applicant has provided here is a transportation planning rule analysis doesn't focus on a specific use. They focus on the most intense use that would be allowed. And you are required to look out 20 years into the future to determine what are going to be the impacts of making this change on the transportation system 20 years out. They didn't provide that. And I'm surprised because the state law is absolutely clear that it's required. But what does it mean it for you? Get it out of the, the, the legal realm. What does it mean it for you as the leaders and policymakers in the city? It means this, that they haven't done a thorough traffic impact analysis that, that determines what kind of impact this use is going to have. Even in their design review, they're just looking at the surrounding area. They haven't even looked at like Ivy Street. They haven't examined what traffic impacts are going to be on Ivy Street. And you have a transportation system plan that says not only do you have current problems in your, with your transportation network, but if you look out 20 years in the future, because that's what transportation system plan looks at, you have multiple failing intersections that will create more congestion and more safety problems than you have today. And guess what else? Surprise, surprise. There's no funding to fix it. And now you have a developer that's here that has a rule that's required to analyze that, that hasn't done that, 
that if they were to, looking out 20 years, there are going to be problems. And guess what? They should be at the table contributing towards the solutions. If you don't require it, then guess what? This opportunity is gone. Because they get to get their zone change, and if their development is approved, you're not going to be able to go after them later on and ask them to contribute. Now is your time. Now, what you've heard is the, the only reason that the analysis is not required. Because I think the law is clear. It's required. Is that this particular change in the text amendment and zone is not going to create any additional traffic because it's a use allowed under the underlying zone. Well, you talked about the fact that the overlay is an overlay on the underlying zone and it creates restrictions. The current overlay is a pedestrian oriented overlay that accommodates and allows for pedestrian oriented uses. They are changing it because a service station is an automobile oriented use. And that's the only way that they can get fit this square peg in a round hole. Now, you don't have to be a traffic engineer, you don't have to be a planner to understand. If you change the zone to allow, go from pedestrian oriented uses to automobile oriented uses, that that's going to create more traffic. And I don't think you have to be a traffic engineer or planner to understand that a service station is going to have significant <coughs> traffic impact. So now is your opportunity to make them do the analysis that they should have done in the beginning and evaluate it. And if there's a problem, we believe that there is. Our traffic engineer concluded that that's the case. And your planning commission reviewed it, and they said traffic's a big problem. That's one of the key problems they have with the application. Analyze it. If there is a problem, they should be required to be part of the fix because you don't have the funds to fix it long term. And so that's the concern that my clients have, is that you can't just focus on the end project that they have in mind because in order to get there, they've got to make these changes to your downtown can be overlay and there's going to be long-term impacts that you can and should require them to assess and address as part of this application. And we feel that they haven't done that. And we feel that their plan will undermine your overlay plan in a significant way. And the Planning Commission heard all this evidence. Many of those commissioners whom were part of the effort with the original overlay plan, and they agreed. And I think that you ought to take at a minimum serious pause as to whether you're going to make that decision tonight in light of that fact. Because this is a bigger decision than just this piece of property. And with that, we ask that you adopt the Planning Commission recommendation and deny the application for the reasons that were cited, uh, specifically the impacts on the overlay as well as traffic. And I appreciate your indulgence uh, for time to be able to address all those issues you know, as thoroughly as I could. And uh, if you have any questions, I I'm happy to answer them. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I need to make one. I almost forgot. Procedural issue. Um, uh, Mr. Oliver submitted uh, a letter information that I haven't seen. Uh, and it's my understanding that this is a on-the-record proceeding and that that would be new evidence. And so my concern is that we haven't even had an opportunity to look at this evidence, which sounds like, from what he characterized, clearly could have been introduced in the Planning Commission process, is now being introduced in this process. And then we'd like to have an opportunity to respond to that if we feel that we need to. I don't know because I haven't seen it. Uh, but as far as I understand, this is an on-the-record proceeding, and that is clearly new evidence. The second procedural issue is um, there's a 120-day time period requirement that applies not to this application, but to the site plan, uh, design review application. And as you know, that's kind of on hold, but that clock is still ticking. And it's my understanding uh, from uh, talking with your staff that Fred Meyer provided an extension because the deadline previously was November 22nd and 
if, even if you were to approve this application today, there's no way the city can meet that deadline, and you would be putting yourself, compromising yourself uh, in enabling Fred Meyer to be able to file an action in court, a writ of mandamus. And I just want to make sure on the record that it's clear that the applicant has provided the city a written extension of that until, from what I understand, December 31st, 2012. Is that 2013. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that was the case because if not, there's really no proceeding other than today to make sure that the city's protected and you're not going to go beyond that time period. So with that, I apologize that I had to throw those last two minutes. Okay. I guess, uh, question, you, have you seen this? Did you get a copy of this? Um, I have. Is that the one that you just passed out? Yeah. yeah. If you want to take a quick look at those, they're basically statements from it looks like three or four people. Well, perhaps the gentleman would like to take it. Yeah. I just wanted to, yeah, I, I did that's what I was going to do. I just wanted to run it through you first there. Okay, thank you. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Give me a few minutes to browse that. Well, and if he wants to use his time reading, if there were other opponents that could be heard in that time, and then he could have some time. We'll let you turn back up. If there is other opponents, uh, they can go ahead. Did I see another hand raised earlier? I'm not going to. Okay, so we'll give you a few minutes to uh, peruse it then. And you guys, you play, break? take a five minute yeah, break. Yeah, I think then. that would be good. Okay, yeah. we'll take a five minute break. We'll be back actually at uh, 9 30. Seven minutes. <laughs> Nobody else decided they were going to uh, be an opponent this time or not? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, again, for the record, Mike Connors. Um, I appreciate having the opportunity to review these. Um, and uh, having gone through these, uh, first of all, I do think they are new evidence. I think the way that you'd want to handle this is to strike it, and that's what we're asking you to do. Um, but if you look at these, I think that they've been grossly over-exaggerated as to what they represent. This is not a bunch of design committee people saying, yeah, everything they said is okay. It's, it's people saying, yeah, I recollect was on, when I was on the design committee that we you know, focused more on design, uh, and I support this proposal. I support the service station. That's all they say. Um, they don't say hey, this line was never intended to be here. You shouldn't have been, been there. I was the one that was saying, hey, you ought to move it. Nothing in you says that. Um, so to the extent that you're going to accept them, I think you have to accept them for what they are, which is just really support letters, not any indication of what the actual task force did or was intended to do or any evidence in the record. The evidence is already in the record. you got the ordinance. you got minutes to that effect. And you got planning commissioners who were involved and gave you their opinion as to what they thought happened. And they take a different position. I'll go back to Joe here. Do um, you feel that, uh, that now that we've actually seen them, can we actually strike them back out and basically not? It, you know, if you want to strike something and, and then uh, assure yourself that you won't consider uh, evidence that was put before you, that's fine. I can attest to that. So you feel that we burn the show? Strike them in, or, or yeah. So I mean, I, it had no impact on what I'm perceiving as the solution here. Strike them. Okay. Uh, can I have all copies and we get back to Joe and we'll. All... Do you have any questions? Of Oh. Oh. Any uh, for Mr. Connor? Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, uh, we now have rebuttal. Yeah, we can hold it to 10 to 15 at the most, please. Oh, it'll be less than that. Five. Oh. 
So again, for your record, my name is Steve Abel. I do represent the applicant. And I think I can be fairly brief in my closing comments. <coughs> um, let me first say that one of the reasons that I brought Mr. Layton up here to give you the pretty extensive and detailed conversation about the planning as aspects of this is that Mr. Layton is a professional and an expert and understands planning issues and can provide the expert testimony that is necessary to understand why the specific fine-tuning that's occurring here makes good planning sense for the city. And with all due respect to Mr. Connors, Mr. Connors is not a planner. And he can certainly criticize Mr. Layton, uh, but his background is not such that he um, is a planning expert. And uh, we have not seen a planning expert appear to talk about any of those issues.